No, we have 7.30, we have sunrise service. And after that, we have breakfast. And after that, we have Sunday school. And after that, we have church. So it's almost like you get up and have your devotions. Then you have your breakfast. Then you go to Sunday school class. And then you go to church. It's almost like a normal day. We know where Easter is. We don't have to hunt for it. So we don't, we don't have one. To that, we say, silly rabbit. <laughs> Easter's to Jesus. Do you have an egg hunt for the kids? We do not. Okay. Do you use to have one? Do you have an egg hunt for the kids? We used to have one. Wait. Well, we should have one this year. Okay, you missed one of our meetings. Yes, I did. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, we have Monday Thursday service. See, we're all about, or I am anyway, I'm all about Christ and the Bible and what actually happened. And I didn't read about the Easter Bunny, What's so I don't do anything about him. What's tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow is Thursday at 7 o'clock. For what? Monday, Thursday. What's that? Monday, Thursday. Monday means command. It was the night in which Jesus commanded us to love one another. And we also do the Lord's Supper on night that night because it was the same night and so that's what we call it Maundy Thursday, Commandment Thursday. That's at 7 o'clock so we'll have a short service, won't be very long, maybe 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer than that and then Easter sunrise service will be a little bit longer than that but not much. Okay? We got it? I think so. If you have any questions when you leave the building pick up a bulletin. I didn't forget that. I saw it earlier today. Okay, what do we got for prayer requests? I did on the first Sunday of the month. What do we got for prayer requests? I, that I get this job that I interviewed for this morning. Which one did you interview for? Um, reading coach. Reading coach. You, you're on that still. Good. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. I have an interview this morning. All right. Well... I, I kind of been watching people come in, and I don't think anybody saw what was available to you. And if you want one, you can have one. Just shake your head if you don't want it. This is basically the same questions I'm going to ask you tonight, and uh, you can fill them in if you want to. So there you go. You want one of these? All right. You're a good student. If you don't want one of these, you're a bad student. Danny. I guess I'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take, I'll take that uh, pens and pencils are up to you to find. Will you grab one or two for, just take this like this right here. And if anybody needs one, give it to them. All right, so we're praying for uh, April's job interview that uh, something good will come of it and she'll get to help coach children to read. What else? Traveling mercies for my mother. She comes from Osceola this weekend, apparently driving her big red truck. She hasn't had a truck before, but she does now. So pray for her, or if you like, pray for those who are on the road with her. <laughs> what made her decide on a pickup truck? Uh, she didn't. <laughs> she didn't have a choice. That's about it. My <laughs> brother and I were looking for uh, vehicles, and uh, he saw a great deal on a pickup, which... He can never pass up. <laughs> there you go. She has a pickup. <laughs> Brother Charles? Never mind. I got it now. It's working. All right. All right. Um, what I decided on this, we'll come to prayers in a little bit one more time to be sure everybody has gotten their prayer request in, then we'll pray. But on the top of this, you'll notice the first question is, why is it that a Christian's joy cannot be taken from him? So we're going to start right there, and then we'll get into the scriptures. 
But I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how this goes tonight, and if you kind of like it, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, I've just basically borrowed every question I'm going to ask you from, the, um, from my uh, slideshow, and uh, you can write them down if you like and think about them later or write them down and think about them at the same time. Maybe it helps to, to really crystallize or uh, make more concrete to you the, the answers if you write. Uh, any other questions before we, any other prayer requests before we uh, <coughs> alert the Lord that we're about to study? I have a praise. What is your praise, Mary? A dear, dear friend of mine, they thought that they had found a spot on his lung. And he went for a CAT scan yesterday, and they reached back 30 results today. And it is a highly hernia that is behind the lung. Wonderful, wonderful. Praise the Lord. That is good. Yes, he is. All right. Let's have prayer and then we'll begin our study. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to ask you for the, the things that we need. Um, help us as we ask for things that we need to be really interested in your kingdom coming into our lives and into the lives of others. We do thank you for this healing that... Uh, has happened. We, that's the way I would understand it, even though it's still a problem. We do pray for the healing to continue. Father, we just pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and insight into everything that we need to do. We, th we do pray for April that you'd help her to get the jobs she seeks, and if not that, then help her to find one better and uh, something that really is uh, exciting and uh, something she wants to work out very hard. Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to have uh, parents in our lives, and I praise you for my mom and ask you to keep her safe and help her enjoy her new vehicle. And uh, I pray, Father, that you will uh, just continue to bless us and lead us. I thank you for my friend John Peake over in Webb City that after so many years has said, I, I will to you, Lord. I just praise you that he is now yours. And uh, excited about that rebirth. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word tonight. It is good for us to think about you and about your son, Jesus. We praise you. We praise him. We thank you for him. We pray that you give us wisdom so that we can understand him better and that he'll fill our hearts. Not, not merely that we'll get the information tonight, but that he will fill our hearts and make our minds and our spirits to be very joyful in him. In him we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, I stand up here tonight before you. Uh, not behind you. Good old joke. Uh, there's a, a cross on this side of me and a donkey on this side of me. And that's kind of where we find ourselves in the life of the church week, you might say. Uh, on this side is the Palm Sunday, the victorious entry of Jesus uh, into Jerusalem on this side is his uh, sorrowful, painful, and awful death that he went ahead and, and went through in a sort of a sense of joy, I believe, because he loved you and me. And uh, so that's where we find ourselves right now in what we call Easter week, or I do anyway, I call it that. And then on uh, Sunday, we get to enjoy the resurrection. April has been kind of quizzing me on, on the meetings as we get... I kind of sat down here tonight, and I'm just going to go over those again right quick. Tomorrow night is Monday, Thursday. It's a Lord's Supper meeting. It will be about 20 minutes or just a bit longer. Uh, and the high point of it will be the Lord's Supper. On, good, on Friday or Good Friday, that's the night Jesus had died, and they took him and put him in the tomb. <clears throat> that Good Friday service will be over here at uh, Full Life Fellowship at, at 6.30. So if you want to come after that on Friday night, that's great. Then 7.30 in the morning on Sunday, we will have a sunrise service and a breakfast to follow. If you're coming, we really want to invite you to come and, and uh, just enjoy. If you got want to bring something with to supply, help with the breakfast, that's great too. Okay, here we go. Why is it that a Christian's joy cannot be taken from him? If I had a, a 
million dollars, and it was in the stock market. You could get my joy from me, couldn't you? Ooh, ooh. I mean, you could because you, you know the stock market crashes. Somebody steals it from me. You know, my joy is down to two. So why can you not get a Christian's joy from him? It's not a physical thing. It's not a physical thing, is it? It doesn't really even have to do with uh, the, the, the physical nature. Rather, it's a spiritual thing, and it's a thing of history. It's about Christ who's already bought our salvation. Now, he did that physically, but uh, it's already done. And now... The joy is in here. It's in me. As long as I trust Jesus, I know where I'm going. I know what I've got. And uh, you can beat me up. You can, you know, make me mad or whatever it is you're going to do. But that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is still my Lord. And I am going to enjoy him forever. So my joy doesn't depart just because of uh, temporary circumstances. I want you to see that. The Christian's joy cannot be taken because the fountains of the Christian's joy lie within him. In his mind and in his soul. Uh, verse 23, chapter 16, we're going to pick up there. I think that's about where we left off. So we'll pick up right there and uh, uh, off we go tonight. In that day, Jesus was telling his disciples, In that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. How does prayer work? If you just had those two verses to go by, how does prayer work? Ask and receive. Ask and receive. Great. I love it. Don't, over, don't, don't overcook prayer. Just say, you know what I need? I ask God for it and he gives it to me. Uh, and you say, well, that is what happened last time. Well, you're going to have to keep looking at this promise. So either one of two things happens. Either you understand it better or you get prayer working the way it's supposed to. Uh, let's go on. Prayer works by us asking for a thing in Jesus' name. Next question might be, how can we be sure we pray in his name? Let me ask you a question. Let's, let's just think for a minute. And uh, I, I'm, I'm building something. You're one of my associates. You're helping me to build something. And I hand you my checkbook. And I say, will you go to Lowe's and get me some, uh, I don't know, uh, two by sixes. They're really expensive now, so you're going to spend a bunch of money. So you're going to take off and go get me some two by sixes at Lowe's, right? Well, you decide that while you're in there that maybe you ought to have a, uh, you, you might want to stop by Megan's place and get her, your hair done. Uh, or you went, maybe you go over to Walmart and want, want to get some snacks or something. If you go to write those checks out for those things, are they really in my name? We don't take those. Okay. <laughs> you're ruining my example, Megan. <laughs> Now it won't work. Cash only. <laughs> what? Cash only. Okay. They're using your name in vain. All right. They're using my name in vain. Exactly. So that's what I'm getting at is you need to make sure that when you go to write a check for the Lord, you're praying and you're saying, I need this. This is what I'm praying for. This is what I'm asking for. It needs to suit his kingdom or don't expect it to get answered. So look that over next time. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus says, in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Read those carefully. Keep reading these carefully. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you will request that I will request to the Father on your behalf. It sounds bad at first. I, you know, uh, you're going to the Father, and what, you're not going to ask on my behalf? No, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth 
from the Father. Why does the God, why does the God, why does God the Father dote on us believers? Why does he dote on us? Because I think that's doting. He already loves us, and he's just going to take care of us because why? Why does God love us so? Because we're his children. We are his children. According to this verse, I want everything to come from the Bible verses. I'm so strict. I mean, your answer is right, but I want it to be, you know, it's kind of like that math teacher. You didn't figure it out right. Let's do it again. <laughs> we love Jesus. Exactly. It's because we love Jesus that God loves us. Yeah. It's because we believe that Jesus belongs to God, and God takes that as a great compliment. Okay. God the Father dotes on us believers because we love his son Jesus and believe that Jesus came to us from God the Father. Uh, 28, Jesus says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples say, lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. If you were the disciple who said this, what would you have meant? <laughs> uh, tell me, because I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not really absolutely certain what these men meant by this, except that something about what Jesus has said has kind of opened their eyes, and they begin to say, you know what? We can trust this man. We no longer have to question him. Our job now is trust. That's what we do. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things that we need to get to as disciples too, right? Wouldn't you say that? That we have to trust Jesus, just trust him. I would, it would, I would have meant, if I, it were me who was speaking that, I would have meant that I am beginning to understand the relationship between Jesus and God and that my role is rightfully one of trust. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming. And has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Do you think this statement challenged their belief, or did it prepare them for a later challenge? Okay. Maybe you think both. it prepared them for a later challenge? Maybe both. Yeah. I'm kind of with you on that. I like that. Do you think that the statement challenged their belief? This statement, it's just almost like Jesus throws up a flag when they say, okay, now we got it. We're going to trust you. Nothing's going to uh, throw us off from our trust. Jesus says, do you now believe? It's almost like he throws a wrench back into that a little bit and says, look at you guys are going to be scattered, and each one of you is going to leave and go to his home. He's going to leave me. And uh, the truth of it is, even then, I'm not really alone because God's with me. Okay, is it a challenge? How's that challenge be taken? Uh, I do think it is both that it's a challenge to their belief to a certain extent and also to prepare them for later challenge. Both, it may have challenged them in that the suggestion is that they have further to go. It also steals them for the coming challenges. So it's, it's a, com a combination of them, I believe. Verse 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Well, that's a bunch of stuff right there. Look at it again. These things I've spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. So the Christian is supposed to have peace at all times. However, as long as we're in the world, in the world you have tribulation, peace and tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Explain the peace that you have. And explain what Jesus has overcome. How come you have peace? Because you're trusting. That's absolutely right. That's part of it. When you trust properly, peace flows. You believe and you have faith. Okay, you believe and you have faith. Have you ever
ever been troubled by things that have happened in your life and, and yet somehow underneath it all, you really just felt kind of calm that everything's going to be okay, that God's got you? Yeah. That's a peace. Pardon? We're supposed to. Yeah, you're supposed to, absolutely. Be open to that. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and help you have that event in your life. Now explain what Jesus has overcome. He says, I've overcome the world. What's that mean, I've overcome the world? All the doubters, all the evil. Okay. Let's look at what I gave for answers, and then we'll discuss if we have some discussion. My peace is in Jesus. Many things may happen to me, but it does not remove his peace from me. Whatever road I travel, it is not new. All the world, as over against Jesus, is failure and defeat. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but take your Jesus and compare him to everything else you know in the world, okay? Everything else is just, it's failure. It's not good, it's not, doesn't measure up to him. It doesn't work. Besides which, Jesus has defeated it all by giving you not only a, a righteous example, but an, a sort of like a, almost like a, an offer you can't refuse because it is so good, not because you're so afraid, but because it is so good uh, that I'm going to go on into eternity with him. I don't have to... Uh, settle for a kind of a second best life, my life is wonderful because God, it's a life that God made for me. And I can live in that and be happy. And Jesus, he has taken care of all of the fears that people like to throw up and say, well, but you're a failure. You've messed that part up. You, you no longer uh, deserve that kind of life that you're expecting. That's correct. But see, Jesus defeated that already. He's uh, taken it away by the power of his cross and by the, the fact of his resurrection. Okay, we're going to turn the corner now and get into chapter 17, which is really what the heading of tonight's uh, lesson was about. That is, uh, we get to overhear Jesus' prayer for us. Uh, all of chapter 17 is the record of Jesus' prayer. It is often called the high priestly prayer. It is called high priestly because of Jesus' prayer is focused on, because most of Jesus' prayer is focused on his followers. Almost all of it is about the relationship of God and himself with the followers and the followers with each other. It's all very much about you and me, I take it. Now, I know some people insist on saying, well, he was really just speaking of those disciples in that time. But there's a key verse later on in this chapter that really helps me to know that what Jesus meant was me and every Christian. John 1, 17, 1. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. What is meant by glory? We've been asking this before. Uh, what, is, what does it mean glorify when he says this? Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. What's that mean? They may be known as who they are. Okay. I think that's great because that's, that does get to be known. And what's, the, what's the, the method of letting us know who God is and who Christ is? In the next few hours that Jesus is alive, what's, what's going to happen? Cross? Yeah, he's going to die on the cross. When Jesus dies on the cross, I think several things happen. One, of course, what we all talk about and should talk about that our sins are paid for. He takes the place of us upon the cross. That's absolutely true. But when you, when you look at it from the standpoint of just, you, if you're just reading the story and you thought of it as a sort of a tragedy that opened up, 
you could see that Jesus is judging the world by the very fact that the world is killing the most righteous, beautiful person that ever lived. The world is under judgment because of what Jesus uh, did and accomplished on the cross. And so there's a glory that comes to Jesus because of that. You begin to recognize how awesome he is, how awesome he is in his love because he's willing to do this for us, how awesome God is in his love. So God really is glorified through the cross and through the resurrection. So when it says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, it's kind of odd for us to think about what he really means is allow the plan to go forward, let me die on the cross for the sins of the world, and then rise from the dead to verify that you, in fact, did send me. That's kind of odd for us to think about, maybe. We think of glory maybe in a different way, but I want you to think about how glorious it is. That's why whenever we get to this part of the year, Christians, hopefully, start to get kind of excited. I do. And it's, and it's, it's about what God accomplished in Jesus Christ. We celebrate that especially during this time of the year. Uh, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So we know that Jesus meant what Jesus meant by seeing what became of him. He accomplished salvation of mankind in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now that, that is glory. Can you think of a story that's any greater than that? I don't. I don't know any story that's better than that. That's the best story that's ever been. That's the best news I've ever had. I love my family. I love my wife. But the best thing that ever happened to me is Jesus. What does Jesus have that he may give? I gave it away, didn't I? What does Jesus have that he may give? He gives us eternal life. Eternal life, exactly. Jesus has eternal life and he may give it. This is eternal life. Do you want it? Probably your antenna ought to go up right now. If you want eternal life, you probably ought to be going, well, I better pay attention to this. He just said this is eternal life. This is like I get to know the end of the equation. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Using verse 3 alone, answer, what is eternal life? Knowledge of God. And acknowledgement of Jesus as... And, and knowing Jesus Christ, yeah, absolutely. When you know Christ, you know God, you know God, you know Christ, you know this, that God, know God, that's eternal life. <laughs> uh, what do you think it was? Just thinking about it out loud with you. Uh, sometimes we think that eternal life is, oh, I died and went to heaven. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, you're getting into eternal life, but there's no real life, there's no eternity without God. And so that's, that's where it really is. It's in God, it's in Jesus Christ. No eternal life, you can know it right now if you want to. Just know God and know Jesus. Eternal life is knowing God and Jesus. Number four, verse four. Jesus goes on, he says, he's still praying. He prays all the way through this chapter. I glorified you on the earth. He's speaking to God. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify together, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I love to listen to Jesus talk. I just, I just get interested in fascinated by some of the things he says, like right here at the end, he says, uh, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Man, what a statement. What is Jesus saying about himself? If you take that at face value and just run with it, what's he saying about himself? He's been around for a long time. Yeah, he's been around for a long time. You know, if you want to understand uh, creation, talk to him. He was there when it happened. 
All right. Jesus is laying claim to being previous to the world with God. So, I have manifested you, your name, he says. I have manifested your name, speaking to God still. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have, everything you have given me, is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. You can hardly believe I went four slides without stopping, can you? Uh, there you go. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. There's so much here. And they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given them. And they have received them and understood that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. So these men, in a certain sense, you might say, they became Christian. They began to say, Jesus is the Son of God. What words does Jesus have in mind that the disciples have heard and kept? It says, for the words which you gave me, I have given to them. Uh, and it goes on and says that, uh, back further it says, uh, they were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. What's the word? What words does Jesus have in mind that the disciples have heard and kept? He did the things in you and he came from God. Yeah, I think that's the big one, isn't it? That, you know, they got it. That they started to say, you know what, Jesus is from God. We get it. Jesus is from God. The very things that are recorded of him in the Gospels also, right? In other words, Jesus tells you all these parables. We haven't talked about parables in a long time. We will again, but... Uh, Jesus has these wonderful parables that he gives, and I think they receive those and take them to heart and live them. But I think the big thing, again, is what Ruth is uh, talking about, and that is that they begin to understand, hey, God has sent Jesus. What is emphasized as the important development in the minds of Jesus' disciples? Well, that, that, that they understand that Jesus is from God. Uh, what is emphasized is that they have come to know and understand that Jesus came from God and that God has sent Jesus. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Who is the object of Jesus' prayer right here? The What's that? The okay. Uh, object would mean who is he praying his prayer for? The disciples. disciples. Right. He's praying for the disciples. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world. Uh, believers are the object of Jesus' prayer. If Jesus asked, is Jesus asking on behalf of those who are aligned with the world. No, he is not. That probably needs to be accepted in your hearty heart heart. You know, sometimes we don't. We Sometimes we think, well, God is just so kind and good and sweet to everybody. Only that's not exactly true because they don't want his sweetness. Those who do not want it, they don't get it. So the answer is no. Good answer. Why does he ask on behalf of believers but not on behalf of the world? He was asking why they're not believers. Because a lot of the, the world are not believers. He asks on behalf of believers because they belong to God and to Christ. But apparently the world would be owned by something or something, someone else. See, this is the problem. That Jesus has come into the world and he's been preached, he's been taught, he's been revealed, you can read about him, and he's wonderful and he ought to have all those ha things happen. And then people see those things and some of them say thanks but no thanks. 
I'm on my own deal. They get owned, so to speak, by something or someone else. I am no longer, Jesus says, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I am come to you. So Jesus now begins to address this fact that these men that I've taught, and I've given them your words, and they've accepted them and started to live that way, but I'm leaving. So he says, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. So this is kind of getting down to brass tacks, what you and I can expect, or what we can have Jesus actually pray for us about. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Isn't it nice having the Lord pray for us before being give, given for us on the cross? and before rising from the dead, and before his ascension to heaven? That's a hard question, isn't it? Isn't it nice? What's the answer? <coughs> yes! <laughs> of course. If we believers are kept in something, then we have unity. What is it that Jesus asked God to keep us in? Now, read that. It's not necessarily the best questioning in the world, but I'm trying if we believers are kept in something, if there's something that we can be kept in, then we have, we have unity because we're kept in that something. So what is it that Jesus asks God to keep us in? Look back at this verse. What's that? Keep us in him. Keep us in Jesus. Keep us in Jesus. And the way he asks it is... Keep them in your name. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me. So... How do we stay unified? By staying what? In Christ. I know that doesn't, that, it might not occur to you, but, but truly, if you and I, each one of us, when we're confronted with trouble maybe between us, if, if each one of us that are having the trouble will insist that I stay in Christ, Christ, in my words, in my thoughts, in the way I behave, that you and I are going to hang together just fine. We're going to stick together just fine. So when you have trouble, make sure this one thing, that everything you are, everything you do, everything you think is in Christ. So that you have a chance to stay together and to love each other as you ought to. Okay. Jesus asked God to keep us in the name God gave him, Jesus, which really means Savior, Messiah, the Anointed One, Emmanuel. All of these are names of Jesus. Each one kind of means something a little different. Emmanuel, what's that mean? God with us. Messiah means the Anointed One. So all of these are wonderful names. Let's keep in Christ so that we can be one in him. Verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. What is perdition? It's what? Trouble. Trouble, did you say? I say hell. Hell. You said hell, okay. Anybody else got an idea what perdition is? Okay, yeah, he was talking about Judas, wasn't he? The son of perdition. Uh, perdition actually means destruction or loss. And Jesus does, or nearly does, turn the phrase upon it, itself. So he says, none of those were lost except the son of loss. I think it's a really cool way, turn of phrase that's, that comes out here. That uh, it's, it's just, none were lost or destroyed except that son of loss or destruction. Uh, so who is the son of perdition? You already told me, Judas Iscariot. All right. What does the occasion of Judas have to do with scripture? According to this verse right here, what does Judas showing up, doing the things he did, what does it have to do with scripture, the stuff that had already been written down? He has to betray Jesus. Okay, has to? Because he fulfill. Fulfill Betrayed. scripture. Yes, both of those I'm taking. That's, those work very well. That's what has to happen. It was written down already. 
And you can find these fulfillments of Scripture. You go back in your Old Testament. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at this and see if you want to write any of those down. Psalm 41, 9, Psalm 55, 12 through 14, 20, and 21. I like that one probably the best of those three that are up there. Jeremiah 20, 10. Uh, and if you have any question about how that's a fulfillment, speak to me and we'll work on it. But now, verse 13, I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What joy belongs to you and me? What joy is ours? Okay, knowing Jesus and belonging to him, it's the same joy as what? According to this verse. I get to have whose joy? Jesus' joy, right? So whatever kind of joy Jesus had, I get to have it too. That's why... He said the things that he did. He says, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. You and I are not supposed to live a kind of a joyless, unhappy life. Instead, we're supposed to have a very joyful gladness in ourselves. A, 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 and I'm not trying to say that you have to go, have to go around just smiling all the time. I, I don't think it'll, I think if you really allow the joy of Jesus to to live in you, you will smile quite a lot because there's a certain joy and happiness that comes with serving the Savior. And uh, I I'm glad of that. There's a joy that Jesus would make full within me. But I have to do what? These things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Something about his word, I think. Uh, they, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, the joy of Jesus, to be of the king, it's wonderful, so rejoice, be happy. You know, um, I guess sometimes when I look at life and I think about, you know, uh, I see an event that happens to me and it's sad and it's hard, it's difficult. And I'm not swearing that I get it right every time I try. But uh, I am impressed by this fact, if I can think of it ahead of time, I can take it one of two ways. I can take it and, and drink the pill, drink, drink down the pill of bitterness and get bitter and angry and sorrowful and mad about it. But Jesus has given me the opportunity to not take it that away. I don't have to. I can be glad and happy. Even we're learning from our, our memory verse even when we encounter various trials. Count it all joy, my beloved brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Why does the world hate the disciples of Jesus? Why do you think the world hates disciples of Jesus? Because they're not of the world. They're not of them. The world hates disciples of Jesus because they have escaped the world. They are not of the world. We don't belong to the world. We're aliens. Kill the alien. It's kind of the way it goes. Verse 15. I do not ask to take you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus asked the Father to keep us from the evil one. How are we set apart from the world according to verse 17? All right. Truth. What else? There's another clue in there. Okay, we're not of the world. Verse 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Yeah, yeah, you and I, if we really want to be set apart from the world, it would behoove us to understand what God has said. That's why the Bible is so very valuable to us. And uh, I would go further than that and say that God 
speaks in his creation. Listen. Of course, the Bible gives you all of the, the revelation that you need. That is, we actually get to see God showing himself off to us uh, through the book. And we ought to know that. Uh, we are set apart by the truth. The truth is the word of God. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. Disciples are sent in the world in a fashion similar to someone else. What is, who else is that? As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Who, yeah, so I'm sent like Jesus, aren't I? I'm, I'm still, I'm in the world, and I, I bear the same mission as Jesus. That the world might see and know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that they might be won over to him, to the righteous God who is all right and perfect for all eternity, and we can get to line ourselves up with him. The kingdom of God is here. My mission's the same as his mission. Disciples are sent into the world just as Jesus was. Jesus set himself apart so that the disciples may also be set apart in truth. What is another word for set apart? Sanctify. Absolutely right. Good job, Melinda. What is another word for set, set apart? The word is sanctify. So when we say sanctify, don't get too excited about it. Don't get too holy about it. It just means I got set apart. If I'm sanctified, I'm set apart. It actually means work. That's what it means. I'm set apart. I'm going to be used for something. That's what I'm really set apart for is to get used for something. Okay. Took off and preached there for a minute. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. I do not ask on behalf of these alone but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. In these two verses, we have what I call the great extension. I love these verses. I, those verses belong to me. Nobody can take them from me. They're tremendously valuable to me. Why would I call these two verses the great extension? I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Why, does it call, why do I call it the great extension? Because God's big family is growing. All right, God's big family is growing. But it, 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 it really means Jesus is, is there, maybe in Gethsemane by now, and he's praying and he says, I do not ask on behalf of these, these little disciples who are here right now with me, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, but on those who believe in me through their word. Whose word do I have in the Bible? Those disciples that were there. That's what I have to base my life on. So what Jesus is basically saying is, I'm praying for Mike. I'm praying for Jerry. I'm praying for and Megan. I'm praying for everybody who believes on the basis of these words in the Bible. Uh, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Call it the great extension, because all, the, all prayers for the disciples living during Jesus' time is extended to everyone who believes their word. In verse 21, something is promised which transcends time, what is it? Mike, what do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it does transcend time in that. Uh, you and I, we have fellowship, right? Mm -hmm. I have fellowship with Mary. I have fellowship with Melinda. I have fellowship with Sleeping Phoenix. I have fellowship with all. 
I do. I have fellowship with him. But I want to tell you something else I have fellowship with. Peter the Apostle. I have fellowship with uh, probably Constantine if he was a real Christian. I have, pro I have fellowship with all Christians, all times, in all places. That's what it says to me. That they may all be one. All be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So yes, it does transcend time and space. Anybody who's ever been a Christian is a brother to me, a sister to me. The unity of believers transcends time, lumping us all together no matter when we learn of Jesus. The unity of believers is supposed to enable something else. What is it in verse 21? I'm, I'm using these verses hard. There's a lot in them. Let's look at that question again. The unity of all believers is supposed to enable something else. What is it? It's in verse 21. What does the unity of believers enable? Down at the bottom of the verse. Conversion of the world. Yeah, the world gets to believe too, if they will, because of our love. If out we have unity and we have love for one another, we take care of each other, we keep living and loving that way, who doesn't want to be a part of that? Some don't, but those that are sensible will. The unity of believers, let's see, there's one. Our unity enables others to believe that God sent Jesus. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are, I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. As a believer, I am given hope to see something. What is that? I get to see something. The glory, the glory. The glory of God and the glory of Jesus. He says, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. I get to see that personally someday. Maybe I get to see some of it now. Hmm. As a believer, I am given hope to see something. What is it? I'm given the hope of seeing the glory of Jesus. Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. What do you know that the world does not? We know God. We know God. If we know who Jesus is, if we know him, we know God. The world doesn't even accept that. that and that's why when somebody comes forward, one of the first things we want from them is I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. Well, the world's not ready to make that proclamation. They don't know. They don't understand. They haven't accepted that knowing Jesus is knowing God. They do not know God. We know that God sent Jesus. Through Jesus, we know what to call God, his name, who he is. What is the result of knowing God's name? The result of knowing God's name is that his love will be in us and Jesus will be in us too. If you're a Christian, there's not really any such thing as, well, I really just don't, don't feel very loving towards that person. Brother, sister, the love of Jesus is in you and alive in you. Allow it to come out. Allow it to grow. Know Christ in your own life. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your will in us. We thank you for Jesus, our Lord, who came and died for us. Amazing. Amazing love, how can it be?
that you'd love us as we are, Lord. We just praise you. Thank you. Give you glory and honor. We pray that in the days that are ahead here as we celebrate Jesus and what he did, help us to accept the power of the Holy Spirit in our spirits, in ourselves. And let us be transformed more and more into the image of him who loved us and whom we have just begun to love, even Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.